Hello, environmental scientists. Today we're going to talk about chapter four, interrelated scientific principles, matter, energy, and the environment. Our objectives in this lecture are to understand why science is usually reliable, to distinguish reputable sources of information from pseudoscience, to understand that matter is made up of atoms and understand what their subatomic structures are, not super in depth, but you should know what are the pieces that make up an atom. Understand the relationship between the state of matter and their energy level. Realize that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted to different forms. And to make connections between energy and food. Um, understanding why science is usually reliable. The scientific method. I know you guys have seen this in different forms probably since middle school. Generally we start with an observation. So a scientist might observe a golden metal, meadow full of goldenrod plants. And as you walk through here you might see some of these balls on some but not all, some but not all of the goldenrod plants. So you might observe something and that may make you wonder like what's the deal with that? So you do a little bit of research. And when I say research, what I really mean here is literature search. What do we already know about this phenomenon that we observed? What do we know about these balls that grow on the goldenrod plants? And you might find out that it's caused, that's a gall caused by an insect laying eggs inside the stem of the goldenrod plant. And that causes the plant to grow this structure, which sort of nurtures and protects the growing insect larva. So that might lead you to having some questions you might want to test, like if these galls are caused by insects, I wonder if it hurts the plant at all. Is there a cost to the plant to having a gall? So you might develop a hypothesis that goldenrod plants with the galls are able to produce less flowers or less floral mass than those without the galls, right? The whole point of a plant is to reproduce. So if the flower mass is affected, then that would be a real significant cost to the plant, right? So once you have your hypothesis, then you need to figure out, well, how can I test this? Um, and if your hypothesis is specifically that goldenrod plants with the galls have less floral mass than those without, how could you design an experiment to test that? Take a moment, pause the video, think about how you might test that. Okay, good. So you might do something like collect 50 goldenrod plants um, that do not have galls and 50 goldenrod plants from the same area that do have galls and cut off just their flowers and weigh them, right? See if there's a difference. So here's some hypothetical data I made up for you. So say here's the mass of, I think I have 10 plants in each data set. The mass of the flowers and plants with galls and the mass of the flowers and plants without galls. And we'll assume these are grams. It's like I forgot to add that label. So if you have these two data sets, is it enough to just look at the data to make that determination? Oh, no. We have to use some kind of statistical tool in order to be able to tell whether these two data sets are significantly different or if they're too close to tell. And to do that, we might graph our findings. So we have floral mass on the y-axis in grams, and the x-axis is just plants with galls and plants without galls. And I used a box and whisker plot. So the top and bottom, these are the, the standard error bars. So if there's no overlap between the standard errors, then we can say that they're significantly different. 
And if you're interested in these types of analyses, I encourage you to take a statistics class or even better biostatistics class. Um, but for us, it's enough to know that if these standard errors don't overlap, then these two data sets are significantly different. All right, so now we can actually say that goldenrod plants with galls produce significantly less floral mass or less flowers than plants that don't have a gall. Now, I just made up those data. I don't know that that's actually the case, but in a hypothetical scenario, this is the process. So do your data support your hypothesis? Well, in this case, yes. All right, and this is important. You need to be able to report and share your conclusions, right? If you cure cancer or solve world hunger, but you don't tell anyone, you haven't actually accomplished your goal, right? So this is really important. We report our conclusions in science. Um, and we do that so that other scientists all around the world can see if our results are repeatable. They can repeat our experiment in different conditions, different places, and see if that phenomenon is real. Or is it just something special about the one meadow where I pulled, um, sampled flowers on goldenrod, okay? Or is that something we see all over the world, wherever there are goldenrod? Or do we see it everywhere where there are galls on plants? All right, so if the phenomenon that you are observing is real, then it should be able to be observed by other scientists in other places. And sometimes a first study of a phenomenon gets a lot of attention in public media. Remember the vaccines cause autism scare? Many scientists around the globe tried to repeat that initial study, but no one was ever able to find similar results. So now we know that vaccines do not cause autism. We have overwhelming scientific evidence that vaccines do not cause autism, but the damage had already been done um, by over-publicizing that initial study. Um, and many parents are choosing to decline life-saving vaccines because of pseudoscience in the media. Pseudoscience, this is an important word. You're gonna wanna understand and be able to decipher and use appropriately. So pseudoscience is when we have things that are not, not well-vetted science um, that are used to manipulate people's understanding of things. Oftentimes there's no science behind it at all. Um, and pseudoscience um, publications and things, will they'll make up words that sound scientific. And because the audience doesn't know those words, makes them feel like they need to trust the source. So it can be incredibly dangerous. All right, so now we repeat the cycle though. Does the presence of a goldenrod, uh, does the presence of a gall cause the goldenrod to produce smaller flowers? And we know in our one meadow where we did our study that plants with galls had smaller flowers compared to those that don't have galls. But does that mean that the gall caused the plant to produce smaller flowers? Can we really say that? Well, consider this, cause and effect versus correlation. Global temperatures are increasing, right? Um, and Taylor Swift is also producing more and more music. Is Taylor Swift responsible for global warming with her hot new tracks? Um, or could it just be that they're occurring at the same time? So there is a correlation between autism and vaccines. And the correlation is just that most autism is diagnosed in young children who also happen to be receiving their vaccines at that same age. Correlation does not equal causation. Taylor Swift is not causing global warming, right? And just because kids get most of their shots at age three and that's when the symptoms of autism happen to manifest and be most noticeable for the first time in their lives, it doesn't mean that the vaccines cause the autism. They're just happening at the same time. So, but that's another way that 
pseudoscience misrepresents real science in the media, and it's usually done to manipulate public opinion. All right, so how can we find good sources of information? Well, peer-reviewed scientific literature is a very good place to go. There are sources of information that are also put together for the public good, and websites with these endings are usually trustworthy sources of information. So if it ends with .gov and .edu, you should be leery of .com and .org websites. Some do have really good information, but these websites usually have an agenda that's not just public education, right? Um, if an article makes sweeping or shocking claims, like vaccines cause autism, it's time to be suspicious and look for reputable sources to confirm or refute that information, okay? So if you see something on a .com or .org and you think, whoa, that's really interesting, dig deeper, go find out more, go look on .gov and .edu websites, or, <clears throat> sorry, go look at scientific literature, like what are scientists actually finding about that phenomenon, okay? We'll do a little bit more than with this. You guys will have a, um, a fact checker activity you'll do online this week to help you practice those skills. So reliable sources of information would be something like the Center for Disease Control, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or Environmental Protection Agency, or even the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Peer-reviewed scientific studies that have been corroborated, so if they've been able to be repeated by other scientists. Um, or something like kent.edu, Kent State University Environmental Science and Design Institute would be another reputable source of information, right? Unreliable sources of information are things like links that pop up on your feed on Facebook and Instagram. And this one especially grinds my gears because I do see a lot of good science pop up on my Facebook feed, but I might see something um, from you know, like the American Association for the Advancement of Science will pop up next to something that, um, you know, somebody with absolutely no scientific background or credentials just cooked up at home on their laptop and put on the internet. And Facebook makes them both look equally credible. It puts them next to each other with the same fancy website design and um, they look equal when in reality they are not. Um, other unreliable sources are publications and opinion news outlets with a bias or agenda and organizations or industries with a bias or agenda, right? So this would be like .orgs and .coms. So just be conscious of where you're getting your information from. All right, so let's move on to matter. You all know that all matter is made up of atoms. And for this class, it's enough to know that all atoms are made up of electrons. These are the negatively charged particles that orbit around a positively charged nucleus. And the nucleus is made up of positively charged protons and neutrons, which are neutral and have no charge. For this class, this is sufficient understanding of atomic structure. Everything's made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of these three types of particles. All right, so if we're thinking about energy, which of these three forms of water has the most energy in it? Good, the water vapor, right? the atoms that make up the water vapor are moving the fastest here. They're vibrating all around, bouncing all over the place and spreading out further and further and further from each other now that they're in a gaseous state, right? Good. So we have lowest energy down here in ice. In ice, the water molecules, the atoms that make up the water, are hardly vibrating at all. They're barely moving, and that's what gives them this rigid crystalline structure. 
and then liquid water would be an intermediate energy level. Those water atoms that make up the water are vibrating and moving around, but not as much as they are here when they're in a gaseous state, okay? And this is a general pattern that's true across the board. Gases tend to be a higher energy level than liquids. Liquids tend to have higher energy than solids. All right, and we'll review the first law of thermodynamics. And this is simply that energy can neither be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So we can convert energy from one form to another, but we can't just make it from nothing. What's the energy form in this picture? Good, it's the cheeseburger she's eating. And she's, her body's in the process of converting it, right? She's gonna use the energy in that cheeseburger to produce heat to keep her body warm. She's gonna use it um, within her cells to break it down into ATP so her cells can do the work that they need to do to move her body and beat her heart and help digest her food and break it down and all the things that a human body needs to do with energy. The second law of thermodynamics is that whenever energy is converted from one form to another, some of that useful energy is lost. And the loss of that energy is called entropy. So you should be familiar with these two laws of thermodynamics, and you should also understand what this word entropy means. There is a general trend in the universe moving towards increasing disorder, and everything's spreading out further and further and energy is part of that so it basically means that energy is constantly being lost and it's being spread out across the universe right and what's the ultimate source of energy here on planet earth the sun right good so all our energy ultimately comes from the sun it gets converted several times while it's on planet Earth, but ultimately most of it dissipates. It's lost as heat, which you can see in this. This is an infrared image. So you can see where heat is being lost. So the warmest areas are yellow. The coolest areas are this dark purple color. But you can see even surrounding this person's arm, there's heat that's being lost, right? And like around the body, the hair, you can see it coming off. He must have something over his arm. Uh, anyway, that's the point. And every time there's an energy conversion, a lot of that energy is lost as heat. All right, so how does this relate to the environment? Well, energy flows in ecosystems. In the 1920s, an ecologist named Charles Elton went on scientific expeditions to the Arctic island of Spitsbergen. Elton was interested in the dynamics of communities of organisms, how they interacted with one another, and he looked at which organisms ate which other ones, like food chains, right? Now, during his expeditions to Spitsbergen, he made thousands of measurements and collected vast amounts of data. While looking at which organisms ate which other ones, Elton collected data on the numbers of individuals of each species in the ecosystem. And his data looks something like this for the mass of organisms in a given area in his study. So grass on this island, there's grasses at somewhere in the order of about 1,500 kilograms per square kilometer. Grasses are the producers in this ecosystem. They convert sunlight energy into usable energy for other living things, All right? Now, snowshoe hares are present at about 150 kilograms per square kilometer. These hares eat the grass and we call them primary consumers. They're the first consumers, they eat the producers, right? Now, since this is an island, it's neat and tidy, and these are the only species that are present here. Red foxes eat the snowshoe hares. They're secondary consumers, and these red foxes are present at about 15 kilograms per square kilometer. 
what pattern do you observe with these numbers? Come up with a way to represent this pattern using a drawing or diagram. Record that in your notes. Pause the video now so you have time. All right, good. So hopefully you've noticed that there's a relationship here by powers of 10, right? However you've drawn it and it makes sense to you is fine. But one way that ecologists typically draw these are something called an energy pyramid. So we have our producers on the bottom, right? There were about 1,500 kilograms of producer, the grass. The next level up, the snowshoe hares, there's about 150 kilograms. The next level up with the foxes here, there's about 15 kilograms of secondary consumers. And all of this energy here is powered by the sun, right? The sun strikes the earth, the grass do photosynthesis, they're eaten by hares, hares are eaten by foxes. And as you go up, the amount of available energy in each level of the food chain is only 10% of the energy level below it. So that's the rule of 10 here. For every 10 pounds eaten equals one pound of new body tissue or biomass available as food to the next organism up the food chain. The rest is used for life activities and lost as heat. So if there was some kind of tertiary consumer or a top consumer, what mass would you expect there to be on this island? Good, about one and a half kilograms, right? Per kilometer. So if there are a top predator, like maybe an eagle up here, do you think there are very many on the island? No, and depending on how big that island is, it may not even be able to support a single eagle. Uh, sidebar, this is an excellent argument for why the Loch Ness Monster can't exist. <laughs> There's not enough energy in Loch Ness to support a giant top predator. Just like there's not on the island of Spitsbergen to support an eagle. All right, so which requires less energy to produce then? A pound of beef or a pound of beans? All right, so here's a hypothetical energy pyramid. If you're going to make beef would be a primary consumer, right? They're herbivores, they eat grass. To make one pound of beef, it would take how many pounds of grass or consumer, or sorry, primary producer? But it would take 10 pounds of plant matter producer to produce one pound of beef, right? Good. How many pounds have to be produced to make one pound of beans? would just be one pound of beans here, right? So it requires less energy to produce foods lower on the food chain. And that's something worth thinking about, right? There are more humans alive on planet Earth today than there have ever been before in history. And tomorrow there will be more humans alive on planet Earth than there have ever been in human history. And 20 years from now, there will probably be even more humans alive on planet Earth than there have ever been before in human history. Our population is continuing to increase. We need to find a way to feed all the humans, right? And we're fortunate at the moment, producing enough calories to feed all the humans on planet Earth isn't the problem. It's distributing the calories to all the humans on planet Earth that is our challenge right now. But as population increases, this will become a bigger challenge to meet. Which requires less space to produce, right? As our population increases, land is also going to become increasingly valuable and in short supply, right? All those new humans that are coming onto the planet need a place to live. So which takes less space to produce? 
a pound of beef or a pound of beans. Good. It's the beans that require less space, right? It would take 10 times as much space to produce one pound of beef. All right, so at this point, you should understand why science is usually reliable. You should be able to distinguish reputable sources of information from pseudoscience. You should understand that matter is made up of atoms and that atoms have subatomic structure. You should understand the relationship between the state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and their energy state. I'd like you to realize that Energy can't be created or destroyed, but it can be converted into different forms and to make connections between energy and food. All right. Please make sure you're writing down any questions you have. Chat with your table mates and um, you can bring your questions to office hours or to class with you. All right. See you on Tuesday, guys.